this is probably not new to anybody here, but just quickly, I think if you think about the big picture frame, uh, if you look at how our low-income students were doing in Massachusetts prior to No Child Left Behind and how they're doing today, it's quite remarkable. Those, those gains, you know, to go from the middle of the pack to, to the top of the pile uh, says something exceptional about what happened in Massachusetts. Those are the NAEP test scores. We were 26th, if you look at that bubble in the middle there, not that long ago. Um, and, and now we're one. Uh, if you're ranking low-income students and their performance on, on, on the NAEPS test. Uh, when we look carefully at the scores of our Gateway City students, we've seen them close a pretty significant gap relative to their, to their peers. That, you know, if you were a, a similar student in a Gateway City district, you were scoring significantly lower a decade ago on the MCAS test than you are today. Uh, virtually the gap has disappeared entirely. Uh, so I think, you know, when you look at what accountability has done and what it's done for our urban districts in particular, whether it's Boston or the Gateway Cities, there's clearly been very significant gains in Massachusetts. But there's no question that there's a lot of room for improvement. We, we, we all know that. We, we hear it uh, from every educator we speak with. The concerns that it's narrowed the curriculum for our, our urban students who particularly need all the opportunities they can get in school if they're not able to get a varied set of learning experiences outside of school. There's a lot of concern that we've set a ceiling by focusing on proficiency, uh, and proficiency not being a high enough standard, uh, and, and in that sense, not really being able to tell families, how, how well are your kids prepared for life beyond high school? Uh, we certainly see uh, the measures we have now are a pretty weak predictor of how, how our students are gonna fare. We see that in the, in the data on college completion here. You know, if we look at our, our Gateway City students or our students from Boston versus students uh, from other districts, we see uh, they're, 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 they're certainly not completing college at the same rate. They're not going on at the same rate. Uh, but the real disconnect is whether those that do on do complete a post-secondary degree, a two or four year degree, and they're completing at half the rate of their peers. Uh, so I think everybody can agree that that gap should be erased. Uh, people who go on, uh, and choose to pursue post-secondary education should certainly complete it. Um, you know, I think there's been other kind of unintended consequences of our test-based accountability. Uh, there's a whole literature that shows it's made it more difficult for inclusive urban districts to re recruit and retain the most talented teachers. Certainly, the, you know, if the intent of the law is to make sure that, that there's equity, uh, we wouldn't want to make it harder for our urban districts who already have an unequal distribution. Of, of teachers to, to, to find and, and, and hold on to those who are most qualified. Uh, we've heard a lot from educators who say these data aren't the data that are going to be most meaningful to us as we're trying to improve our practice. Uh, and there's a whole literature around organizational effectiveness. If you want to be an effective organization that's driven by data, you need to have the right data and you need to believe that the data you're operating with are, are the data that are most meaningful to you. And I think we hear all the time particularly from teachers in inclusive urban districts, that the assessments that they're looking at aren't appropriate for the needs of their students. Um, and they're not helpful in communicating with their families about where their child is and how much progress they've made and how, how much further they have to go. Uh, you know, there's, there's a very big concern in my mind as an urban planner that we misspecify the problems by talking so much about the underperformance of our urban schools. Uh, it's, it's obviously not up to the schools alone to solve all the achievement gaps. They originate from many sources, uh, whether it's housing, racial bias, all sorts of things that are our community's problem and need to be addressed very holistically. And we've seen this most recently in mapping patterns of incarceration in the city of Boston. You look at neighborhoods, in, in, in some neighborhoods in our community, and virtually every other house has a family member who's been incarcerated. And, and you think about a school operating in that context, Sure, there's a lot we can do at the school to address it and ameliorate the stress that children are under. Uh, but I, I think you know, a more profound intervention would actually be to address the issue of mass incarceration. And so uh, we need to acknowledge those issues and work on those just as hard as we work on urban education reform. Uh, and, and the last piece is, is, is the, the issues of property values and neighborhood sorting. I think there's a lot of concern uh, that we've really 
to increase segregation, racial and, econ racial and economic segregation over the last two decades. A lot of the gains we, we were seeing uh, in closing achievement gaps were coming from desegregation, and we've kind of reversed course on that. Uh, and there's real question about whether our test-based accountability has, has increased the, uh, the sorting of affluent families away from inclusive urban districts. If you look at this chart here, this is just looking at Gateway City districts, uh, but we definitely saw a steep acceleration in the percentage of students in our Gateway City classrooms who were low income, uh, you know, since we passed No Child Left Behind. All kinds of factors are contributing to this, but it's something that we should be sensitive to. And I think as we've talked about accountability, there hasn't been enough focus on how, how are what we're doing representing the performance of our inclusive urban schools accurately so we can communicate to parents about you know, what are the assets of our urban districts? What are the benefits of being educated in these inclusive urban environments? So uh, I just want to finish just by talking a few, for a few minutes about what the public thinks about accountability, uh, because they do have opinions. They don't know anything about S at all, uh, but they certainly know about assessment and testing in schools. Um, and, and you know, one of the things that w we started with in polling them was how well a job we they thought students were, schools were doing overall in educating students. We just asked them to grade the schools. And you can see here that when you ask them how they're doing preparing students for the future, uh, that's where they get the lowest marks, a C or less, uh, almost half of all parents. Uh, it's even higher if you asked urban parents, but this is all kind of voters in Massachusetts have real concerns about whether our schools are being as effective as they could or should be with, with uh, college career preparation. Uh, you know, another thing that's kind of outstanding, uh, uh, surprising is when you ask parents if they have enough information to make decisions about what's a quality school, the majority say no. Uh, we're spending tens of millions of dollars collecting data on schools, and parents don't feel like they have enough information. When you ask them how they make decisions, they say primarily by talking to friends and neighbors or based on their own experiences, so not, not on the data. Uh, when you ask them what... This is a massing poll that was conducted in uh, the end of November, early December. Um, and there's the, the full polls on our website. When, when you ask uh, you know, whether they'd like to see a grade for schools or a level or some aggregated measure of school performance, the most majority say no. Uh, uh, overwhelming majority would like to see multiple pieces of information to make their own decisions about school quality. Uh, and then when you ask them who's most responsible uh, for measuring the performance of each school. Surprisingly, the majority of folks, and even more so in our gateway cities, I don't have a Boston breakout, but I wanted to show that there was a strong urban effect here. Uh, people would, would, would rather see uh, real local involvement in, in deciding whether their schools are working, uh, you know, whether that's city or town administrators, principals, teachers, parents. They, you know, I think you know, for the purpose of our conversation today about local accountability and and how communities decide what their priorities are and measure and hold everybody accountable, mutually accountable for getting there. Uh, you definitely see that sentiment strong among, among voters in Massachusetts. So that, that's all of uh, my slides. Um, to help kind of set context and further ground our conversation this morning, which we hope will be a really interactive one. I think it's good that we have a small group in that sense. Uh, we've got three academics uh, that we're really fortunate to have and uh, we picked these people because uh, you know, they're really focused on accountability in the context of our urban communities. There's lots of experts in the community in the Boston area on accountability generally, and they can tell you about NAEP scores in the US versus Finland and so forth. I think what we really want to hear about is how does it play out in terms of governance in urban communities? How does it work for understanding the complexities of urban districts? And particularly, when we're thinking about what people are saying they want to see most is improvement in, in getting our kids ready for college, career, and civic life. How do we measure those things well and make sure that all our students are on that trajectory? Because ultimately, I think that's what all our, our work is for. And 